Hello everybody, it's Grandmama. Time for another story from a hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherax. This story, George the Greek. Hello there, did you ever hear the story of the Aberdeen man who wrestled the champion of the world in the old Edison Theater? Did you ever hear how Aberdeen promoter Ed Dolan bet a hundred dollars on the local mauler and lost? Well, it's quite a yarn, as such stories go, and the one that we found tonight in our hometown scrapbook. After Dick Crombie has a few seconds for our sponsor's messages, we'll unwind the story of George Krakakanis, who locked horns with Frank Gotch in the wrestling bout that old-timers still chuckle about. But first, Dick, a few words from the sponsor. Now, in the early days of the harbor, when entertainment was a little less polished and professionalized than it is today, this was a profitable stop for professional wrestlers, and the grunt and groan boys made regular trips around the circuit, including Grays Harbor. They usually played two nights, one in Aberdeen and another in Hoquiam. It was a day when wrestling was somewhat more the athletic feat that the old Greeks intended it to be. Oh, there was a little bum comb in it. Some of the grunts and groans leaned to the dramatic side, but such wrestlers as Frank Gotch and Farmer Burns were real catch-as-catch-can artists, and they took the canvas mat display to an all-time high in this country. It was the first years after the Great Aberdeen Fire had swept through the city's business district, and among other new landmarks on Aberdeen's Heron Street was a sandwich wagon of George Krakakanis. I'm not sure of the spelling of the name. Every city directory for ten years gave it a different twist, but it was unmistakably George, the sandwich dispenser, who was known to young and old in the harbor as George the Greek. Now George, regardless of his prominent spot on the corner of Heron and F Street, would have passed into oblivion long ago if it had been forced to rely on the quality of his food for a niche in the scrapbook. No, it wasn't as a cook that we remember George Kirkrakenis, but rather as a wrestler. Or was it? Wrestling, as some of you students of the classic will recall, was a prominent sport in Greece. And, to this day, a big percentage of professional wrestlers trace their lineage back to the rocky peninsula that Ulysses called home. And George, while he wasn't really a wrestler, took advantage of the background for a little personal publicity. The, ins the inside of his sandwich wagon was plastered with pictures of the great Greek wrestlers of the day. And when he was talking with a stranger, George would casually admit that he once, a long time ago, but once, had been a pretty good man on the mat. It was common knowledge to the men about town that George, who had a ne necklace built of a, of a wrestler, had either been, was, or wanted to be considered a wrestler. Well, one of the touring wrestling shows that covered the county sent an advanced man to Grays Harbor to post the bills for the Big Mac Carnival. It was to be the biggest thing of its time for Grays Harbor. There would be preliminaries with local men and boys, then a featured event that would pit two of the big professionals of the county in gigantic struggle for supremacy. It sounded good. And the bill poster? A free pass man who preceded the wrestlers and who arranged the matches with some of the amateurs who handled the preliminaries heard of George. He stopped to have a cup of coffee at George's wagon and talked. He asked a lot of questions and finally suggested that George might be interested in appearing in one of the preliminaries with one of the traveling company. He pointed out what such a thing would mean in publicity. Then, of course, there was the chance for George to prove that he really was a wrestler. 
and to make certain of his men, he promised that he would arrange to have George's opponent take it easy. He carried George for a round or two before he got down to business, and besides, there would be a five dollars in the deal too. It was too much of an offer. George snapped at it, and from that moment until the hour of the fight, George thought of nothing else, and the town talked of little else. The posters that advertised the coming event carried his name under preliminaries. There it was, George the Greek Carcanius. George had a poster on each end of the lunch wagon, two inside, and the back was covered with them. Well, the great day arrived, and the wrestlers who arrived on the train and stayed at the Crescent Hotel gravitated down to George's wagon for coffee and to talk things over. George got acquainted with the mauler that he was to wrestle and was told to come to the Edison Theater early and he would be given a pair of tights and a few lessons in how to conduct himself. At the hour, George was on hand and ready for the big day in the sun. The old Edison Theater that had been burnt out of its Heron Street location by a fire was located in the new building on Wishka Street, just about where the Art Davies gift shop is now. And when George got there, it was packed with fans for the big bouts. <coughs> the late Earl Morgan fought with Roscoe Johnson in one of the preliminary bouts, and then George made his appearance for one of the current razors of the main event. George heard the applause like music to his ears, and when the bell clanged, he locked arms with his adversary and waltzed around the ring. He strained, tried, and his opponent did his best to make George look like a wrestler. And so well did he succeed that there were many in the house who were convinced that George would have won the bout, only that he seemed to slip and fall in the deciding round. But as far as George was concerned, he did win. For his stock in town went sky high. Young and old folks flocked to George's sandwich wagon to listen to his stories of how he had once fought the world champion. For by this time, George's imagination had taken up the torch and was providing him with the background of a professional wrestler. A lot of old timers who had known George for the full five or six years of his residence winked and chuckled. But others were captivated with his stories of the ring. And for many months, George lived on that publicity he had received from his $5 wrestling match. Then came the spring. And near as old-timers can recall, it was the spring of 1905. And into town on the morning train came the advanced man for the biggest wrestling show that had ever played Grace Harbor. It was to feature the main event, Frank Gotch, claimant of the world heavyweight wrestling title. Now, professional wrestlers were probably a lot like most tradesmen. They passed their professional secrets along from one to another, and when the advanced man arrived, he sought out George the Greek. He had talked with George and explained his proposition. Frank Gotch felt that he could draw a record crowd to the match if he could wrestle a local man. It would have twice the drawing power of a match with a stable mate a match that people would say was fixed. He would give George $20 if he would meet the champ himself. Oh, he assured George, don't worry. We'll see that the champ lets you down easy and think of the publicity of fighting the championship of the world. When he left, George had agreed and the advance man had agreed to bill it as the bout of the, for the world's title. Well, sports fans looked forward to the biggest thing athletically that the harbor had ever seen. The next few days saw George out on the plank deck of the Pioneer Saloon, lifting weights and bending bars or working at it. He was, so he told his followers, his followers, getting ready to lift the crown off the head of the world champion. And sure enough, the bill posters that went up around town heralded the fight as the bout with George the Greek meeting Frank Gotch, the champion of the world. It was almost too much for George, whose stories now became frantic. Leaning on the well-greased counter with his hairy, fat hand, he would keep his listeners spellbound with tales of his wrestling ability. And then, the daily train from Olympia brought 
Frank Gotch, and the stable maulers. Well, George invited them to make his sandwich wagon their headquarters while they were in town, and they did drop around to have a cup of coffee and a chuckle. For by this time, George's wagon was festooned with pictures clipped from the police gazettes of most every wrestler in the ring. ring. That night, the Edison Theater was a sellout. In fact, the late Earl Morgan recalled, standing room was sold out solid. Again, two of Aberdeen's favorite boxers, Earl Morgan and Roscoe Jensen, boxed the opening bout, and then the members of Gotcha's table went through their antics for the audience. Finally, the announcer called for the main event, and George the Greek, pride of Aberdeen and champion of F Street, attired in a clean pair of brown tights, stepped into the ring. The partial crowd roared its approval for the local man, and George beamed from behind the ropes of the theater stage. When Frank Gotch appeared in yellow tights and a red robe, the crowd greeted him with a standing shout, and when he crossed the ring and shook hands with the Aberdeen's entry, whose necklace, necklace's head was buried in a towel, the building shook with applause. Then came the bell. Well, George had absorbed some of his own stories about his wrestling ability, and he charged at the world champion with a rash abandonment. The two locked arms, and Gotch proceeded to maul George around the ring. It was not completely one-sided. There were times when George seemed to get the upper hand and then would lose out to his opponent. But finally, with what appeared to the audience to be a superhuman effort, Gotch dropped George on the mat and pinned him down. The crowd groaned. Some of the groaners came from the vicinity of Ed Dolan, pioneer saloonman, who had taken a great interest in George and bet heavily on his chance to win. And when the wrestlers came back for a second round, Dolan rooted loudly from his seat in the middle of the audience. George had other boosters, too, for a lot of money had been put on the local man's chance to come out on top. There were the times in the second round when it appeared that George would win at any moment. He seemed to be wearing the champion down, and the crowd roared for him to throw the champion and take the fall. But finally, when it seemed Gotch was about to be dropped, the champion came back and pinned George down for a second fall and the match. Now George jumped up jubilant. Gotch had prolonged his licking so much that George felt everyone would regard him as a hero. But actually, the champion had so effectively played his part, carrying George through the long minutes of the two rounds, that to many of the audience it appeared that George had lost only by sheer chance and given another round, would win handily. That was the way it looked to Ed Dolan. He leaped to his feet, waving a handful of bills, and shouted, Here's a hundred dollars that says you can't do it again. The crowd roared in support of Dolan, and Gotch sent one of his men to cover the bet. More money went up, and Gotch's men covered every dime. Then the champ squad squandered away for deciding to fall that mean cash on the line, he looked around the ring and no George. It didn't take long to locate the Aberdeen contender. He was locked in his dressing room and refused to come out, but Gotch had no solution to that. He pushed the door in, seized the hapless sandwich man by the scruff of what should have been his neck, and dragged him out into the ring. Then, without waiting for formalities, he put a hammer lock on George, dragged him to the map, picked him up again, spun him around his head, then slapped him down on the mat to lie cold and quiet while the crowd looked on in stunned awe and amazement. Gotch grinned in a friendly way of a cat that has just eaten a canary, waved to the crowd and left the ring with George lying quietly, still unable to rise. And with George in that position, let's have Dick have a few words from our sponsor. Well, the star that George had raised so high in the town's estimation set that night for the Sandwich King. Most of the town saw through the frame up and told the story of Dolan's loss and George's showing with tears of laughter. And it wasn't long after that that George closed the wagon and went to work in an obscure job down the street with his brother Nick. And it wasn't long after that when he decided that maybe he'd do better in some other town where people didn't know.
that he had once wrestled the champ, or at least didn't know the facts of the case. And George drifted away from the harbor to leave it with a story that sounds like something from a pen of Runyon, the story of an Aberdeen sandwich man who wrestled the champion of the world and didn't win a title, but found himself a secure niche in this, our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening, everybody. Good night. Thank you.